excited about it and going, oh, yeah, I must pick up a CS team. We're going to get our exclusivity league. We're going to have PEA, right? And then, obviously, all of that got shut the fuck down because that's not how we're going to roll in CS, you greedy fucks. You have to put the time in, make good decisions <coughs> to get success in the CSGO space, which is why fucking people like this will never stick around. But you notice the caveat. In his statement, he said... We maybe will come back one day when the time is right. And what does he mean by that? That like when he can get either a winning team for peanuts, like on, on, on a free transfer or whatever, or when there is some sort of franchise league. Like these are the guys that like say they bought uh, the EU uh, LCS slot from Dignitas and then fucking yeah. stalled payment for a ridiculous amount of time. It was like six hundred thousand or whatever, and and they it, you know Audi was still fucking trying to get his money. Like, however many, you know, I think next, like, a year later, you know? It's it just absolutely ridiculous that these people are coming out and, like, talking about it. Like, A, they're good businessmen, and B, they actually do legitimately care about esports and <coughs> type of bedroom organization that just got lucky and got some money. And they throw enough fucking shit at a wall, and they hope some of it will stick. And that's all they do. That's their approach to everything. And fuck organizations like that. I don't want more bedroom organizations coming into CSGO with their amateur hour bullshit, putting people on shit contracts, building shit teams. It, it, it offers nothing to the scene. Anybody that laments the passing of Splice like, just doesn't understand the fucking CS ecosystem at all. The thing I find so bizarre about it is, like you say, these people generally do tend to sort of, if not outright brag,
Not outright brag, like actors though, you know, like I rewrote the book on business. I mean, by the way, I'll include Nor Winston for Immortals when he first came in. Remember his first six to nine months? He was all over the place. He had only just literally come out of college and, and had Immortals. So what's bizarre is this is what they tend to confuse, Rich, right? I absolutely agree with them. Back in the days of esports, to raise millions in sponsorship or investment was really fucking hard, especially investment, actually, because obviously back then you never had investment. It was just sponsorships, right? So what happens is they seem to naively not understand that that is on one level impressive, getting a lot of investment. But if you then piss it away, how impressive that is goes rapidly down. The impressive, What makes it really impressive is to get all the investment and to actually make some money. Now, some of these orgs, including, this is obviously the rumor about Immortals, isn't it? That the LCS certainly has not done a, I think they purposely put that news out there through other people. They're like, oh, that's the reason why they didn't get in. It's their business model wasn't sound. Well, the problem is some of these companies, we don't know if they've ever made a red cent. We literally no. don't. For all we know, they just fucking took millions and millions and then left. You know what? Some of them are so good, they go back and get more. Or they find someone who's even willing to invest without wanting full equity or something mental like yeah. that, you know. They're all and, and, great in that first meeting, but yeah. actually making money. I mean, I, I don't know how many of them would be willing to open their books and show me that they're killing it, you know. Yeah, and it's just absurd. Like, I, I thought, like, um, there was, like, another discussion talking about, like, investment and all this. This is kind of a run-on from this uh, conversation. And they were, there was, like, Jack said, oh, the Overwatch League has given us levels of uh, sponsorship, sponsorship return that uh, we didn't even think were possible in 2018. Well, it's like, yeah, because you're running an, as it should. First of all, the amount of money that's been thrown at the Overwatch League, despite it, it, its um, non-proof of concept, is absolutely absurd. When you've got the number being banged around, and all the numbers are lies, by the way. No one has actually paid the numbers. It's like they, they are supposed to, but like the $20 million slots, that's spaced over four or five years. And you even know. The, uh, you'll notice it was never actually Blizzard who said everyone paid 20 million. They said like it could be up to 20 million, and then yeah. they even implied that it would depend on the slot, you know. Yeah, yeah, you, it would negotiate, yeah. yeah. But every every fan since takes that as if it's like the low end number, and so like everyone paid 20 million, and therefore yeah. they go, a 240 million dollar league or whatever, you know. Like. And so by the way, right. the dirtiest thing they did, because I saw this when Overwatch League first launched, was I started seeing news posts claiming that the Overwatch League had already made hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. Counting yeah. the fees which had not yet even been paid. No, but that's exactly what they're doing. Blizzard <laughs> put a statement out saying oh, our revenue projections. They did this just after the Twitch uh, right. sponsors, which, which is, you know, keep in mind there, there were people at Twitch who no longer work for Twitch that are very cozy with Blizzard, and I wouldn't be surprised if they took jobs. And balls deep in Overwatch, by the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, well, that were balls deep in Overwatch, guaranteeing it, front page viewership, really out there pushing it, writing blog posts, pushing it, and saying it was unequivocally going to be a success. And Twitch, mysteriously, I mean, this is the number that's out there, paid $90 million to get yes. the to get the broadcasting rights for Overwatch, when in no way... Could it ever be worth that? In no way is that a good and it, business. And by the way, from, from the people I talked to, the intimation was they didn't just do a deal for these are the rights and here's 90 million. Oh, like, no. Twitch is getting something extra out of it. As in, yeah. they also have some kind of a guarantee of something that makes them think, yes, we'll definitely jump on board this thing. It's not that they're just going, wow, yeah, the rights are worth 90 million, you know. Because there's a couple of things that are so suspicious with all of that. Like, first of all, yeah, like, first of all, I, I, this almost deserves like its own video, but what kind of a ridiculous straw man do the people who are in favour of the Overwatch League have that like the fact that it hasn't had to close its doors already before season one ends proves that the concept worked? And yeah. somehow, having 100,000 viewers also proves that the concept worked and that it was worth all the hundreds of millions. And the fact that, like, they make out as though, me and you, Rich, were saying, like, oh, what'll happen is, after the first day, they'll just close the fucking doors because it won't have a million viewers. Like, what kind of mad all... It, 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 this yeah. is... Absolutely, the jury is still out on whether this has even worked. Yeah, I know, right? And, and keep in mind as well, like, <laughs> obviously, part of this... Uh, right, part of all of this, give us the money now, is we will give you the rights to sell things and, and it's all all of this 20 million investment for a slot 90 million for the broadcasting rights is all predicated on revenue streams for these non-existent orgs what they have all in their bull test case which i've seen in a morgan stanley book, they are comparing it to like the merchandising in the wwe something that's been around for decades and all of this right now if you're telling me 
that people care as much about London Spitfire, a completely fictitious organisation that has absolutely zero ties to London, by the way. It's an NA organisation with Korean players, right? So, yeah, that's fucking... Go oh, bleeding, blow me, Gavner, half a cup of tea. I mean, fucking hell. It's as British as British as the Queen, that is, isn't it? Um, you know, it, it's just ridiculous. If you're telling me that there is going to be a hunger for an organisation that can only exist in one game and one game only, can't even have an academy side without it being separately branded, right? Like, because Blizzard want to build up all of these fucking brands. If you're telling me that that is going to be a legitimate revenue stream where I'm going to go to London one day and just see Spitfire shirts everywhere, you're mental. It's not going to be like that at all. And let me also tell you, and I've said this multiple times and no one cares, one of the things that they were bragging about in this Morgan Stanley report is you will get more return on your... You will get more sponsorship return. You will get more revenue return. Do you know why? Because only 10% of the revenue generated will go into the hands of players. And they bragged about it. Now, keep in mind, in, in, in the average franchise league, it is between 48 and 55% of all revenue generated goes to players. In the Overwatch yes. League, it's 10%. It's 10%. And they did some covering fire for that by basically going out and saying, oh, look, we're guaranteeing minimum salary. We're guaranteeing benefits. Yeah, we can also film you while you're asleep. But we didn't put that bit out. Um, and, and we certainly haven't published it. So the idea, the idea that you wouldn't make more sponsorship in that environment, of course you would. But what are you making it for? It's not for Cloud9. It's not for the brand you own and control. At any point in the contract, Blizzard can take back London Spitfire from Jack Etienne. And if Jack Etienne decides to sell it, he has to give 25% of any money he makes straight over to Blizzard. This is all common knowledge. So I have no idea why, why you would come out and present this. Yeah, you make more money in the short term, but you absolutely do not control what is making you the money. So how good is it really? That if Blizzard ever decide Jack Etienne is an undesirable character, they push him out the league and London Spitfire gets given to someone else. They can do that. So if you want that to be the CSGO environment, which I absolutely do not. Oh, I think that actually, is a dystopian nightmare. Here's the thing, Rich. I'll tie it back in because people might think like we just went on a rant about the Overwatch League there. But no, here's yeah. the key thing. In the context of Splice leaving and, for example, recently, we did see over the last, I'd say, year, year and a half, NA orgs in CSGO were willing to pay way less than the European orgs. And in fact, a lot of the European orgs notably were people who aren't in the Overwatch League or in the LCS. There was many of the top EU leagues, EU orgs that are paying the big bucks for all those huge salaries you hear for the Virtus Pros of the world, the Norths. They don't have teams in the Overwatch League. They don't. Justice ain't gonna dispense itself.
not unfinished business. Finished business. into the mix. Personne n'échappe à mon regard. Let's start over at the beginning. Enemy needs 10 kills to win. Ah, oh. Head for the hills. I'm on fire. Much better. Don't move. Enemy needs five kills to win. Back in the saddle again. 